which was a um, semi-triumphant slide where we, we improved the state of the art for the Kikia maximal conjecture. But uh, only in intermediate dimensions, which was quite strange, I think, that somehow the method is not very efficient in low dimensions compared to other arguments. And so this, these use kind of geometric brush arguments. Um, and this one. And so this was the, 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 geom the semi-algebraic geometric, but then in higher dimensions also, uh, the cat's tau via uh, 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 arithmetic combinatorics had a better band from 98 dimensions onward. So uh, the next thing I want to tell you about is how we managed to improve this slightly and then at least beat this as well. So then we get all higher dimensions. And so how did, let me see if I can remind you of, so one of the key ingredients of that proof of that result was this bound on the number of tubes, which are lambda, a lambda proportion of them are contained in a delta neighborhood of an algebraic variety. So the smaller the proportion, you pay a price, but essentially this is telling us that the number of tubes can be no more than my delta to the minus m minus one when you put this on the other side, which is like saying, remember in Rn, you can have no more than delta to the minus n minus one for delta separated tubes. So this is like saying that in any algebraic variety, it's like, well, you've got the same number of tubes as in Rm. So somehow that's telling us that that was somehow in the argument here where we go down to the m dimensional case and we're able to treat these m dimensional manifolds so this is when the tubes are now sort of living in this m dimensional ma uh, the delta neighborhood of m dimensional uh, algebraic varieties so that this the, the polynomial wolf axioms allowed us to remember this was delta to the minus n minus one, which is just a, a bound on the total number of of directions. Well, the polynomial wolf axioms allowed us to say at least that much. That that that, that it's like in the n dimensional case. And so, uh, how did we improve from here? So that. The point is that uh, in order, in fact, we have more information from this argument than just the, 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 the tubes are living inside the delta neighborhood of an M dimensional uh, algebraic variety, because we also know that the they all they live in an n plus one dimensional algebraic variety and of course the one is contained in the other so what difference does that make the point is that as you come down the, the, the these steps uh, where, where, where every time we use the polynomial partitioning argument to break up into smaller and smaller cells so this lambda this price we had to pay with lambda is getting bigger and bigger the smaller the farther you go down so what, by the time we get to M dimensional case, the Lambda is very, very small and we have to pay a bigger price here. So I'm hiding that Lambda here. I haven't, I haven't explained that part of the argument. But if, if, if we should have this Lambda power here and when, 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 when you get down to the M dimensional case, Lambda is very small and this constant is very large. However, when you were in the higher dimensional case, the lambda was larger, you'd taken less steps and these cells were bigger. And somehow the, although the delta was not as good, uh, the lambda was better. So can we take advantage of that? 
And the answer is yes, we can. So, so in order to improve on this point, we proved this somehow improved version of the polynomial wolf axioms. Well, not now, now for the specific cases that we're interested in. And so before this theorem told us that we could bound that this was be the same. And then here we would have lambda to the minus n minus one. But as I was saying to you, the lambdas are larger. This lambda n minus one is larger than this lambda m. And so this is an improvement. This is the same when you, you know, if, if these were all the same size, then this is exactly the same bound as before. But if this lambda is bigger than this lambda n, then this is an improvement. So uh, also Josh Zhao, so I proved this in collaboration with Hickman and Zhang, but also Josh Zhao proved it simultaneously, kind of um, surprisingly. Uh, and well, maybe not, I guess in hindsight, not surprisingly, it means the argument was somehow more obvious than I thought it was. So, uh, so how to, how to prove this one? Well, you use, the, this is the, the, the first version of the theorem. So we have this, instead of lambda, we put lambda to the n minus one, it's the first lambda which appears. In the, in the polynomial partitioning argument. And before we took this to this E to be exactly this set. And then we use Wonku's lemma to bound this. This Wonku's lemma tells that this is bounded by uh, lambda to the n minus one to a certain power times by delta. But that would not give us that would give us actually a good thing with lambda, but a bad thing with delta if we just use this. If we also know this information, it's best to use this information to get a good power of delta. So what we did, but the, remember in the argument, this E is the set which contains all the tubes or contains all the lines within the tubes. Maybe you don't remember, but this was the, the argument in order to prove this. Basically, we, we just need to, this E can be taken to be any set, well, yeah, it's any set which contains the tubes, which is semi-algebraic. So can we construct a smaller set than this guy, which contains all of these pieces of the tubes? Contains all the lines of the tubes. And the answer is yes. So once we, I'll show you what this relevant E is in a moment. And then we prove some kind of wonku style lemma for this strange set. So instead of just taking the delta neighborhood of an uh, algebraic variety, we, we have a kind of strange set and then we get this bound for it. And just like with Wonku's lemma, you have, this is bounded by some power of lambda n and some power of delta. Well, now our strange set is bounded by some power of delta and all the lambdas because we're going to use all of this information. And when you put this guy in here, then this guy is cancelled with this guy. And this is this. And then we just divide through by delta n minus one to get this. So what is this? Where, where do all these tubes live? If this is if this is true, so we're going to do it now. Just in I can't draw obviously in very high dimensions, but I'll do it in three dimensional. If we think of n being r three, m being one dimensional, and this n minus one is two dimensional. So we've got two conditions. Then this the, the bound that I showed you before becomes this bound here. And so where, where do all these, where do these tubes live? So here is, we know that a lambda one proportion of the tubes lives in this delta neighborhood of a one dimensional algebraic variety. And we know that the tubes, a lambda two proportion of the tubes lives in this 
delta neighborhood of this two-dimensional algebraic variety. So we know that here the tubes and this the, the tubes uh, are not here. They're they're all contained here. And then what? But after uh, once they once they're escaping out of here, we don't know exactly where they are out here. So, however, we do know that the, the, the tubes which are all contained in here in this proportion, when they come out of here, they, 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 they will live in some kind of, if you draw a line, all the lines which live in here and you just extend them, you get this what I've called sprouted region. Now we use some kind of algebraic arguments, very similar to the ones that I presented in the first lecture to show that this sprouted set cannot be bigger as you can bound it by the measure of this uh, times by this, where this three is n. Right? <clears throat> now that looks very obvious when, you, when you're talking about it, when it's one dimensional and this is, if this was just a, a little piece of a line and this is a little tube, then of course that you just extend this and then this is a very obvious thing. However, in general, you have to prove this with when it's not when it's not even a delta neighborhood of an algebraic variety anymore. It's one of these strange sets. So we iterate the process in order to go up and up. And so this is a kind of strange set. And in order to prove that this doesn't extend in size too fast, if the if the if the, if, the, if this set was very strange, it's not so clear that when you extend out. Uh, it, 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 it does so in a bounded way, but it's true. You just use some algebraic arguments. And then we, we also know that so the, lines, the lines live in here. And so after they come out, they must live somewhere in here. And also we know that they live inside this delta neighborhood. So really the set we're interested in is the intersection of this blue region, the sprout region with this gray delta neighborhood. So that's, that's what the set is, this red set. So rather than it just being the delta neighborhood of an algebraic variety, it's this kind of strange thing. It's still semi-algebraic, of course, but it's, you know, kind of strangely shaped now, somehow. Yeah, it's, it is what it is. And so now we need another argument to prove. So we're really interested in the intersection of the sprout with this gray. And we use some kind of covering argument. Again, it's fairly obvious here that this is just a this is you, this is just a ball intersected with this guy. And so by Wonk, you can just apply Wonku's lemma directly. However, this is not normally just a, a ball. So normally you have to cover it up, use some trigonometry to prove some bound. And, Wonk, and then finally use Wonku's lemma on these, the, the balls with which you've covered this thing with. And then you get this bound. And so all together, you put E is less than or equal to this, which is less than or equal to this, which is less than or equal to this. One of these cancels with this, we get the, this power. And then finally, you can bound this by Wonku's lemma, which says, of course, that this is, as measure delta squared times by lambda one. So if you use this slightly better polynomial wolf axioms theorem, multi-scale polynomial wolf axiom theorem, you so that's what, what we got before. So that was just with Jonathan. And then we proved that that theorem I just explained with Ray Shang Shang as well. And then altogether the arguments give you this. And so they're, they're slightly better in most dimensions. And, and then in particular, we get um, some asymptotic bounds. So you can put alpha n, you can always put one over two minus square root of two here. And Recall that the, this is the maximal Kikea conjecture, which implies bounds for the Hausdorff dimension of a Kikea set. 
And the best known bound for the Hausdorff dimension of a Kakea set was, so, so Katz and Tao had seven over four for their maximal Kakea bound, but they had a slightly better, they had a better bound for their Hausdorff dimension estimate of the Kakea set. And they had an even better bound of the Minkowski dimension of the Kakea set. But anyway, this is what they got using additive combinatorics to prove that a Kakea set in Rn must have, I can't remember what I'm saying. So Katzenthal pr proved that the Hausdorff dimension of a Kakea set must be greater than or equal to this using additive combinatorics. So that, that method was um, very different. So what you do for that is you kind of slice the Kakea set, you have a bound above on the slices by the measure of the Kakea set, if you like. You can arrange the slices so that they are like some sets and then use additive combinatorics to then you extract, take that bound and turn it into a bound for the different set. Now, when you take the difference of two slices, you get the, because they're, they're, two, they're the lines, when you take the difference of two lines, you get the direction. So you found the bound of the Kakea set below by the directions, which is what we've been doing as well. But they use this, these additive combinatorics to get the bound. Now, bizarrely, all of this, which is so completely different, it, it would be difficult to be more different. <laughs> it's completely different, right? And with all of this, we get the same, we get asymptotically the same bound. So there's one over root two that I told you before. When you, when you, I told you, so it's the P, you get the Hausdorff dimension of the Kakea set is bounded below by P prime. And when you take the P prime of that P that I showed you, you get this as your leading term. And so because bizarrely we, so asymptotically is the same for the Hausdorff dimension. And sometimes it's slightly better and sometimes it's slightly worse. So there's an infinite number of dimensions for which we get an improvement. And there's an infinite number of dimensions for which we don't get an improvement. <laughs> and so, uh, and I could explain that to, why that is true. That is because really, we don't work with the LP norm of directly. We work with the, we work with multilinear norms, uh, which become, which, which are identically zero if you go down too many dimensions. And that gives you some, that allows you to use more inductive energy earlier in the process and get improved bounds with respect to the Lebesgue exponent. So if you use a multilinear norm, you can get a better P. But then you need to turn that multilinear bound into a linear bound using an argument due to Bourgain and Guth. And depending, you need, and, and when you do that, you need to choose the, the best K linear norm that you have. And depending on luck essentially, well, sometimes the, the, the argument of Bogan and Guth to turn it back into the linear bound is limiting. And sometimes it's, it's convenient to move down K. If you're thinking about K linear, maybe you should be thinking about K minus one linear. And so exactly when it's good and when it's, it's slightly better in some dimensions than it is in other, when this argument of Bogan and Guth somehow coincides with what you're getting for the K linear. And when it doesn't, it's not as efficient, and then we, it's not as good as the cats and power band. Anyway, so that's all the Kakea. So now I wanted to um, talk about uh, we're all. So the Kakea set conjecture um, has been around for a long time, but the Kakea maximal conjecture in particular. Uh, became very um, popular, for want of a better word. It became, uh, it became, in the 70s, they realized that the Kakea maximal conjecture had strong connections with 
convergence of Fourier series. And so now I want to explain some of that stuff. So I remind you of the definition of the Fourier transform and its inverse. So I'm going to talk about the uncertainty principle mainly just so that I can show you where the tubes come from, right? So if this is the probability density of the momentum of a free particle, then F squared is the probability density of its position. And so, as we know, the, the uncertainty principle says you can't know the momentum and the position simultaneously. And that's just shown by scaling, right? So if you, if you know that the momentum is in a ball of radius delta, so imagine this has support in a, a ball of a unit ball, well, then this one has a, a supported in a ball of radius delta. But then when you plug it into the definition, make a change of variables, so say y is equal to psi over delta, well, then this Jacobian determinant comes up, and then y is equal to psi over delta, the, so psi is equal to y delta. So you should have y delta here. You can move it over here. And then that's just this, right? So you, I'm sure you've seen all this before. But um, so now this guy, if you know that it's, so let's presume another manifestation of the uncertainty principle is you can't have compact support on both sides, but I'm going to completely ignore that, right? Let's just suppose that you can. Or we can think about Gaussians, right? So a Gaussian essentially supported in a ball of radius delta, then the, the, then this guy is supported in a ball of radius delta to the minus one. So you kind of have these dual things going on on either side. So where do these tubes come from? Why, why, do, why is this, the, 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 the principal reason that this has got something to do with the Kakea conjecture is this thing here. That if you take a cap, of a thickened piece of the unit sphere. So if you look at the unit sphere and they hear some theta, that's theta. <laughs> and then you take a little cap of thickness delta squared. and length delta there. Well, then it's just the same as before. Well, I mean, you've got some translation. So the translation, uh, if you translate on one side, that's just the modulation on the other side. And because, before we had just delta, bo delta balls become delta, uh, delta to the minus one balls. Well, now these tubes here, because you well, because you're even thinner here, you get a tube, which is on the on the frequencies on the on the on the on the spatial side rather that turns into a tube of thickness minus one and length delta to the minus two. So. If you have lots of different caps like that on the frequency side, then you've got lots of different tubes like this on the spatial side. Now, you can just you can just rescale these tubes by delta to the minus two, and then you get the. Sorry, I'm using my hand. You can't see my hand. So then you get um, this. Can, you can scale that back down so that this is length one, and then this becomes thickness delta. So the, the same tubes as before, just scaled. So, uh, so, so the so the Fourier series question is this. So the, the, this was called the disk multiplier conjecture back in the day, but I'm going to call it the ball because it's the same in other dimensions. So basically, if this is not integrable, it's not so easy. Just to, you can't just apply the the, the the what I what I. The, the inverse because the inverse involves an integral right so you can cut it off and then you can take limits and see and ask whether this converges to this so this is kind of fundamental question in harmonic analysis and by the uniform boundedness principle this is equivalent to this uniform bound that 
well, you use the uniform boundedness principle to show that this implies this. And then to see that this implies this, I've written down the argument briefly. So um, first of all, we take some smooth diversion. The problem here is that this cutoff is not smooth. And so that if the inverse Fourier transform of this is, is badly behaved as a consequence. But if we smooth it out with this factor here, so that in one dimension, instead of looking like the cutoff being, so this is distance r, so we're just, we're just sort of smoothing it out in one dimension, it looks like that. Then it's, um, then in fact, so this, this thing is just equal to uh, the convolution of the inverse Fourier transform of this. And so if you smooth it out enough, then this is actually integrable. And then the, as, it would, as I was showing you before, if you've got, if you've dilated by R on one side, you need to dilate by R to the minus one on the other side. And so this is now, if this is support, this is supported in the ball of radius R, this is now supported in the ball of radius R to the minus one. So as R goes to infinity, this is converging to a Dirac delta. And so this is a much nicer object. So we want to show that this converges to zero. So we can add and subtract the nicer object and then use and then use a, the linearity of this, the definition of this and this, we can just put all of this, all of this guy and all of this guy together. And then we see that but there's this on both of them. And so we can just pull that out. So you can you can write you can write i to the b, you can write this identity function twice. So and then pull it out, and then you've got this. And so if you've got this uniform bound, you can bound this whole thing, you can get rid of that. So you get rid of that, and then you write them using linearity, you come back out. And so as we just saw, this is an approximation of the identity, the smooth guy. And so as R goes to infinity, you can use the usual approximation of the identity arguments to prove that that is indeed converging to zero. So in order to prove this, you need to prove this, but also vice versa. If this convergence is holding, then this must hold. Now, then Pfefferman used a Kakea set to disprove this bound. In fact, in fact, this is scale invariant anyway. You can just scale and then turn this into the unit ball. And so he proved that this, this inequality does not hold if P is not equal to two using a Kakea set. So this was the first connection between Kakea and Fourier analysis. And it was a big deal, I, I believe. I wasn't around. But um, so why is this? Because first of all, it's worth noticing that a Kakea set, a Kakea operator like this, will decompress these Kakea sets. So remember, I showed you that you can construct Kakea sets which are getting smaller and smaller and smaller measure. So. Another way of saying that this has got smaller and smaller and smaller measure is that the LP norm, as long as P is not equal to infinity, this will converge to zero. However, if you take some kind of Kakea operator, which at point X, so if you take this point X here, if this is X and then you, um, And then you take a tube which comes in here and averages like that. Well, then at that point X, um, X is K, the operator K of F is not going to be zero. In fact, it's going to be roughly, let's say, a half. 
And that's true of all of these points that live down here. So somehow you recover the size of this guy. So this guy, on the other hand, is not converging to zero. So obviously, this Kakea operator is not bounded in LP when P is not equal to infinity, but just using the existence of these Kakea sets. So what Feberman proved was that somehow you can use that to, to show that not only is the Kakea operator, so that's just me writing that Kakea operator as a convo, it's the same thing. So these are tubes sent to the, the origin. And so uh, if you subtract X, then they're sent to the X. And it looks more like a convolution now. And so notice that, uh, so before we were talking about the Fourier transform of these caps. So by the convolution, you can write this as this cap by F. And remember that this cat, the inverse transform of this cat is looks like one over the the, the size of the tube uh, with some modulation. It was the cat. This is the characteristic function of the tube normalized with some modulation. So you when you write the convolution, it looks like this, and it starts looking a bit like that. And so when you look at this operator, you can divide this guy up into little caps, right? You can do lots of decompositions of the, of the, the ball into little delta neighborhoods, and then you can cut it up into little caps. And so this is like a sum of all of these guys, if you like. And this is a supremum over these things, but let's just pretend for, well, essentially that's the idea is that there's some similarity between this and this. And so, uh, and so because as we saw, we have Kakea sets which go to zero. KD, uh, the Kakea operator, or Nicodem, as I've called it here, because there's two different, slightly different Kakea operators. This one's the Nicodem operator, decompresses. And so, so obviously you don't have this Kakea bound. So that should be mass cal K. And so if this is the same as this, well, then you can't have a, a, a disk multiplier bound either. And so why is this not, why, why isn't this argument good for P equals two as well? Of course, you always have the, the, the just by Blanchard-Ell's theorem, this is true when P is equal to because you can remove that, then remove that, and then remove that. So I'm telling too many lies here. Somehow this is so. This is kind of self, this is a self adjoint operator. So I can just kind of throw the adjoint in for free, and then it's more like a squared because you've got all of these oscillations, and so you expect some cancellation when you add things up. But you don't expect perfect cancellation. Moreover, you don't expect um, zero cancellation. You kind of expect square root cancellation. So that's why there's a square coming up. And also there's a, an L1 norm, a sum here, and there's a supremum norm here. That's another justification for why this is the adjoint. And so if this adjoint is not bound, so the P, the, the, the P, if, if you're talking about LP here, you're talking about P over two prime here. So when P is equal to two, P over two prime is equal to infinity. And that's when this argument, this, the, the, this certainly can, does hold when, when, when this number is infinity. Okay, so I don't know whether I'm overdoing that. So, uh, given the, uh, one question. So, so, what would the adjoint look like? I mean, uh, you have written. So, this is kind of like the adjoint of this. 
So th this is self adjoint. Like the sum, perhaps, because you are taking supremum over t. I mean, I mean. Yeah, yeah. So in here you have a sum. Yeah. This is a sum over lots of caps. So yeah. the adjoint looks more like a suit. Mm -hmm. But I mean, this is completely vague. Please don't take this too seriously. Yeah. I'm just trying to give the idea of how Kakea came about, actually. Mm -hmm. So, of course, so Pfefferman deserves a lot of credit for this sort of this connection. Yeah. yeah. And I'll come back to that this 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 relationship in a moment. So, so what? So given that the disk conjecture isn't true, what can you hope for? So you need to smooth this out a little bit uh, in order for this convergence to hold. And this is called the bock norris conjecture. And so again, you hope for this guy to converge in LP or in other senses, we'll come to that in a moment. And but you need this lambda to be this big. So when p is equal to this number, this this is zero. But you need lambda to be strictly greater than zero when p is not equal to two. And so again, this would follow from a uniform estimate. And again, this is scale invariance. So you can take r equal to one here. And so in two dimensions, this was proved by Carlos and Sholin. So that in two dimensions, P is equal to four. And in higher dimensions, Guo, Wu, Wang, Wu, and Zhang uh, improved the state of the art using these semi-algebraic geometry techniques that I've been talking about very recently. So, um, so they use some kind of conformal uh, change of variables in order to turn it more into the restriction conjecture, which I'll come to um, in a moment. So somehow bockner is the big motivation. And then bockner was, Stein noticed the connection between the restriction connection uh, con conjecture, his restriction conjecture and bockner conjecture. And then the re I'll come to the restriction conjecture in a moment. Ah, so here's the results. So this, this Wu is one of these Ws here. And so they also recovered this result in three dimensions. So somehow the semi-algebraic is the best in all dimensions now. Well, I don't know if they recovered this actually. Um, and I don't want to say too much about that. I want to, what I'll do is I'll tell you about the restriction conjecture rather than this. And I should have some open questions. So the, here are here are sort of stronger versions of the bockner reese conjecture, weighted bockner reese So if you can prove this inequality and some bound for the Kakea, but this you expect this to be some kind of Kakea operator, then you recover bockner reese So why is that? Because this is the LP norm. We can square it. P over two, because P over two times two is P. And then by duality, we can write this, we can realize this P over two, LP over two norm by multiplying by some weight, which is in P over two prime. And then if we have this inequality, we can use it. And then if we have this inequality, oh, sorry, then we do Helder's inequality to get back into LP here. So we do Helder's inequality with P over two, and then we get FP, and then we get this guy in P over two prime. And then we have this bound P over two prime. Uh, so we can replace this with this, but this is bounded by one. So, we just get a constant. So you get the bockner reese bound if you can prove this weighted inequality and the Kakea style inequality. So I, yeah, something to notice is that the Kakea conjecture is expected to hold an n over n minus one. And that's, or sorry, 
in my dual, the, the version of the Kakea maximal conjecture that I've talked about before, it was dual, and we had n over n minus one appearing. And so this is where the two appears. So actually, you expect this Kakea maximal operator to be bounded in, in Ln. And that's this divided by two, and then you take the conjugate exponent of n over n minus one is n. And so, so this was proved by Cordell in two dimensions improving the colors in Charlene. And then the best results in higher dimensions are these results. And so an open question is, can these semi-algebraic techniques be used in this context to prove something here? Maybe not, I haven't really thought about it, but I just wanted to point this out because this is another way of seeing this kind of adjoint. So I remember this is, I told you that the square is somehow adjoint to this K, right? So that, that this is another way. So before we used the K operator in a negative way, we said, well, because this Faulkner Reese operator, the, this, this, this multiplier operator is similar to Kakea and Kakea can't be bounded. Well, then we can't bound the, this multiplier operator. But here we're saying if you can bound the Kakea about, uh, operator, then you can, but if you, and you can prove this kind of thing, prove this kind of adjoint relationship that I was talking about before, then you can use Kakea to imply Bokhnaris. And so that was another. So this was this was older stuff that where they were thinking about this kind of thing, and but I'm going to show that there's even more strict connections now. And so you can also think about the maximal Bochner Reese operator. So if you can prove this, this simultaneously tells you that the operator is converging in LP to its function, but also in almost every point, although they already know that. But anyway, this kind of bound is also interesting and by the same argument. So before, this is this is a uniform bound. This C must not depend on R. So you've got some supreme in R outside. Can you put it inside the norm? And then you get it inside the norm. So again, the best bounds are, so Carberry proved that in two dimensions. And we, there's not, these are the best bounds, I think, in higher dimensions for these weighted, things but not for the the just the lp norm stuff so can the can the geometric arguments be used here i don't know so anyway Fourier restriction i think i've gone too slow so Fourier restriction conjecture is this stein conjecture that this inequality should hold uh, obviously, this can't hold when Q is equal to 2, because by Plancher-L's theorem, the Fourier transform of every L2 function is in L2, and there are L2 functions which are singular on the sphere. So this would be infinity, and this would not be infinity, so no chance of that being true in L2. On the other hand, when Q is equal to 1, then this is bounded. And so you can just use Helder's inequality to go from Q, the L1 norm up to the infinity norm and down again. So, you know, by the, by the Hausdorff Young inequality. So this is clearly true when Q is equal to one, clear, clearly not true when Q is equal to two. And there's some map example to show that this is the best you can hope for. And this is equivalent if you, if you try and realize this Q norm using duality, you put, take away this and you put some G here, and you have G, some function supported on the sphere. This is the measure on the surface measure on the sphere. And then you can do uh, Parseval and move the Fourier transform off of F and onto G to sigma, which is what we've done here. So that's the formal adjoint operator. And so if this P, is the uh, Helder exponent, you know, conjugate exponent of Q, then this is equivalent to that. 
And so the range goes from being this to this. So we see this number appearing again. This is twice as big as the, the, the Kakea number we, we wanted for before. So now this conjecture is somehow similar to the Kakea conjecture that we were looking at before. And people have used Fourier's restriction to prove Bognerese stuff in the past as well. And Tao proved that Bognerese implies res this restriction conjecture. So anyway, can we, uh, the restriction conjecture is still open. It was proved in two dimensions by Pfefferman and Thang. And but can you, can we, similarly, remember we had results with, we had one over one over n minus one was the, if we had some alpha in front and what was the best alpha that you can prove it for? So Thomas, Peter Thomas proved it with four. And then there was a long period of time when, not, when there were lots of, there was a bilinear decade where lots of improvements were made in low dimensions, but not in, not in these higher dimensional stuff. Borgan and Guth then improved it using multilinear techniques. And then Guth improved it using multilinear techniques combined with polynomial partitioning. And then myself and Jonathan improved it using the polynomial wolf axioms. And then Jonathan and Josh improved it again using the multiscale polynomial wolf axioms. So this is now all very similar to what, what I was telling you about in Kakea. So now I'd like to tell you why this restriction conjecture implies the Kakea conjecture. Because then you kind of see why it's possible to, to use the same arguments as before. So the point is, if you take this G to be characteristic functions of delta caps on the sphere, then these are like these delta caps from before, right? So, so here is the sphere again, and we're looking at a delta cap. This distance is delta. And so if you take the Fourier transform of that, that cap, it's on, the, it's on the sphere now rather than a, a thick piece, but it's the same holds true, that it's then supported in this big tube of the Fourier transform of that cap looks like this big tube, delta to the minus one and delta to the minus two. And you can randomize the caps if you wish. And so when you integrate, this is an integral, you just get the cap, that's the size of the cap. Uh, it's also the size uh, no. Yeah, so that's what you get. That's the size of the cap in this case. And you get some, some, um, some, ra you, see, you get some oscillation as well, but you can also randomize. So then by Kinchin's inequality, because this is randomized, you put this into here, by Kinchin's inequality, you expect, again, you expect square root cancellation from these randomized variables. And so this would imply this, where this is just the, the LP norm of G, because this is the, the, the size of a, what, a single cap, and then you add up all of the caps. This is just coming from this constant to the power of P, bringing it from here onto the other side. And then this, it's just the square, instead of having the sum of these guys, we have the, 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 the L2 norm because of the randomization. But then, of course, this oscillation disappears because of this norm. And so we're just left and the, the, the square of a characteristic function is just a characteristic function. And then you rescale. Remember, we want these tubes to be, we want to rescale by this factor so that this length is one and that this width is delta. So these are now the same tubes as we have before. And having done the rescaling, uh, yeah, this factor comes up because you have delta to the minus two N appearing. On the, when you scale this, that appears 
in the Jacobian determinant. This is invariant under the scaling, of course, so you just bring it over. And so if P is equal to 2n over n minus 1, then this is 0. And then this P over 2 is n over n minus 1. So that's exactly the Kakea conjecture from before when you're at that. It's it, Partial results are not exactly the same. This constant isn't exactly the same. But when you get to the end point, it's exactly the same. So we see now that the restriction conjecture implies the Kakea conjecture. But moreover, I wanted the, this kind of thing to be seen. So here we have each tube, each direction. We, for each cap, we have a, one tube in the direction of the cap. However, for, for ge more general G, right? These are, these are very specific G. What we do is we can do a wave packet decomposition, decompose this into these tubes, but you have many different tubes in the same direction. However, you can reduce this to some kind of sum of tubes. And then uh, we can, but, but, well, before we do that, in fact, we, um, we do the polynomial partitioning argument from before, right? So remember, we can divide this guy up into lots and lots of different pieces. And so that's what we're going to do now. Polynomial partitioning. But then we can do the wave packet decomposition and we have the tubes that we had from before. And so why is it important? Well, we need tubes because that's exactly, you know, the, 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 the fundamental theorem of algebra will tell us that each of these tubes can only intersect. We, we have to remove the delta neighborhood of the, 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 the variety, which is dividing up these cells. But then we know that each tube can only intersect D plus one different cells. Once we've removed the delta neighborhood of the algebraic variety, then we have the cells. So this is all the same as before. And then, so we, we can sort of repeat the argument from before. So this is the algebraic argument, the non-algebraic non argument. That if you if you keep dividing up and then you if at each at each step down you go to the cells, well then each step you need to multiply by some numbers in order for this to bound this. But we need to be careful that this doesn't blow up. But if this if the measure of the cell becomes very very small, then you can just use Helder's inequality to go up to L infinity, and then this is bounded by the L one norm of G naught by by Hausdorff Young and then you just do um, well this is very trivial then you just do held it to go up to L2 and then you can do the same kind of so this G naught so this G O G cell is 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 formed by all the tubes which intersect take all the tubes which intersect the cell and then this G, for every tube, you have a frequency support of G. Each frequency of support of G, or it's not frequency rather, it's actually the, the well, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the tubes and the support properties of this G. So you've got one of the, the support on the frequency side or the spatial side controls the direction of the tube and then the, on the other side of the, the on the spatial side say that that controls the, the starting point of the tube. And so uh, and we can pull this out as before. So we have a this to the power of P so we can pull a bit of this out. And so this is, but this time we have a bound on this by the fundamental theorem of algebra. That's because as I was saying, you can take, this is a sum, this is formed up of a sum of supports, both frequency and spatial, but they can both come out because of Plancharel's theorem and we're in L, L2. 
So then we've got a sum over supports, but we know that there's only d to the k repetitions because you only count that each, each tube can only hit d to the k different cells. So you have this property, which means you have this property because there's d to the nk in this sum. And so if this were not true, this would be broken. And then you plug this in here and this in here as before. You get this. And then you rearrange. You get this. And then as before, if P is bigger than N over, is bigger than 2, uh, 2, uh, 2N over N minus 1, then this is a negative power. And then we can deal with these growing constants because this is all less than one. So it's a very similar argument in the, in the end. I mean, and I should say that this argument was developed by Guth in this context. So, so without the polynomial wolf axioms, you can't do anything for Kakea, but you could do something you could get. He got an improvement without any polynomial wolf axioms. And what does polynomial wolf axioms give you? Oh, and so, and sorry, when you, when you, sometimes you go down dimension, then you're in the n dimensional case, the m's go to m, and it's like before. Uh, and the polynomial wolf axioms, remember, we're looking for an LP to LP bound, not an LP to L2 bound. So you can use the polynomial wolf axioms to say that so only so many tubes of different direction uh, can intersect this delta neighborhood of an n-dimensional variety. And so if there's only so many different tubes in different directions, that tells you for every, the directions of the tubes are controlled by the support of this G. And so that gives you a control over the support. So when you do Helder's inequality to go up to uh, L infinity he here, sorry, so I should have been talking about this. When you do Helder's inequality to go up to L infinity, you, you get a gain. And so you can do, and then also you can use the multi-scale polynomial wolf axioms to get an even better game. So I've run out of time, you know that. And so that, those were the, that's with the polynomial wolf axioms. And then you get more improvements with multi-scale polynomial wolf axioms. And I'll stop there. Okay, uh, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful series of lectures. So, um, are there any questions? Sorry, I went a little bit fa fast towards the end, I think, but. Uh, yeah, but it was, yeah, it was good, actually. Yeah. Today was yeah, uh, it was amazing, I would say. I mean, yeah. to see this connection between the three oh, main objects. Thank you very much for this. Uh, yeah, right now I don't have any question. Yeah. Well, thanks for listening. <laughs> no, it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. It was really nice, actually. Yeah. Mm. And it got me thinking again. <laughs> So this, uh, uh, you said that restriction conjecture implies Kakea conjecture. Yeah. Right. And uh, okay, so it's almost like it, it's not exactly in a circle, but uh, I mean, yeah. So the Bochner is uh, um, sort of um, depends where Kakea conjecture fails. Yeah. Makes all sense. Well, kind of. Yeah. Well, that's more like the disk multiplier. Fails because Kakea fails. Yes. Uh, somehow, no, Bogner Reese implies restriction, which implies Kakea. Yeah. So Tao proved that Bogner Reese implies restriction. Borgan proved that restriction implies Kakea. Okay. And 
Herit and his maximal kakea. But in, in growing up was always kind of thought to be, I mean, they, they could even be, they could, these implications could also exist. Kakea implies restriction, restriction implies bognaris, but no one's ever proven that. And, and it's not, um, for instance, this arithmetic combinatorics technique that was used by Katz and Tao and Kakea, no one was ever able to use that in restriction or in Bokhnaris. However, these techniques that I've presented, although this, these implications still don't exist, um, all the, somehow, somehow the results are all the same now. That you can, you can, you can get this, they're not exactly the same P's either, but some, you know, so the Kakea P, the Kakea P's are half the restriction P's, which are the same as yeah. the Bokhna region. But, but they're not exactly a half, actually. But somehow, the full strength of the argument has been used in all three contexts now. Or the same strength, the same level of strength. Perhaps someone will improve, uh, this, the, 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 make the argument more efficient. But right now, at the, they're, they're all at the same level. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And once again, uh, thanks a lot for uh, taking your time out and uh, giving the series of lectures to us. Um, I enjoyed it. Thank you for yeah. having me. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully, uh, you know, we would be able to invite you to India <laughs> in future. <laughs> I would love to come to India. I will definitely come as soon as I'm invited. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if, if there are no more questions, uh, please thank the speaker. You can clap or, uh, you know, you can just click the uh, reaction here. So yeah, I, I will definitely clap. So thank you. And uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, I'll end the meeting then. Okay, thanks. Yeah, okay, thank you. All right.